So we'll just start from the top down. Um, what are both your thoughts on rural transport? Well, I'd say um, rural transport is it's an absolute key issue. Um, what I hear from constituents is that, you know, it's too expensive, um, particularly for young people. You know, I hear from folk in the rural area that they're having to, you know, drive their kids to work in Stirling um, because the, the, the bus fares, et cetera, are far too expensive. Um, and I mean, you know, going forward, given that we're going through the pandemic, how it's already affected young people, um, we really need to look at this. I mean, I, I know the SNP has made the pledge if we're re-elected that bus travel for under 21 year olds would be free. And I think that will obviously help. But the other issue, I suppose, is do we have the right services? Are they going to the right areas, etc.? So I, I really do think that the whole thing needs reviewed. How, yeah. how do you feel, Jim? What, yeah, about that point that you've education? just made. Yeah, that point that you've just made is probably, I think, the most important one is the irregularity of bus services. Um, I know where we're living, um, there's a bus will go past at half past eight in the morning, then it'll come back at half past four at night, and that's it. That's the only service you get. And this doesn't even go the the road that main road that I'm talking about is actually it's a B class road but it's still a well populated road and it doesn't have any um off route for some of the, the the other conurbations that are further up the hill. If we're going to get to net zero by 40, 40, 2045 and we want to cut down emissions, I'm driving a four wheel drive vehicle, my wife drives a four wheel drive vehicle, everybody that's in this we area that we live are driving four wheel drive vehicles. If we're going to get to net zero by 2045, we need to have a public service structure that takes account all of these things. And a free bus journey to an under 21 year old is of no consequence if the bus is only going to come at half past eight or at half past four. So if we're going to have connectivity in a, a physical sense in the rural population, then we have to do much more to build up the availability of, of um, buses and transport for people to use public transport. Yeah, I think the other thing that would be really useful is if we could look at the, the rail services as well um, and possibly look at, you know, reopening some of the, the old rail branches that we had before. Uh, obviously, in the borders, this is absolutely regenerate. You know, it's regenerated the borders, um, reopening that line. Um, yeah. And I really think in my area... Uh, possibly yours as well, Jim, that would make a huge difference to these rural areas. Yeah, yeah. There's a, a one of our councillors in, in Perth, Andrew Parrott, he is determined that the rural infrastructure and the, the, the transport infrastructure in the whole of Scotland is going to be upgraded. Uh, he wants us to, to make sure we've got a, a direct line from Edinburgh that comes up, stops off at Kinross, stops off in Perth, goes on to the northeast. And he's got all these fantastic ambitions for the things that, but it, it, he's almost like trying to to reinvent the the old lines that Beechin did away with. Um, but that if we're going to change our transport system and get people off the roads, then there has to be another way for them to be able to move. So whatever it is that we're going to look at, I think we need a, a much bigger, broader look at the entire rural infrastructure in terms of transport. Yeah, absolutely, and. Um, I think maybe if if the SNP is re-elected in government and we are able to move ahead with maybe the nationalising of the railway, maybe that will give, give us more control to reopen all these issues and, and, and look at the railway again, where it goes, you know, into these rural communities and the benefits that it could, be, could bring for us. Well, if we're going to be ambitious, that's a good place to be ambitious. It is. It is. And it will help with so many of these other issues, won't it? Opening up these areas, helping people to stay rural, uh, you know, yep. this, the, the depopulation issues that we have. Um, yep. Yep. I, I think that that's a really exciting agenda. Yes. Uh, it's, it's definitely something that we need to be... Um, 
when we're talking about the big ticket stuff, uh, obviously it'll affect your constituency, it'll affect our constituency on a local level. But when you're talking about big big ticket stuff, then that's the kind of um, that's the kind of ambition I think we absolutely need to be looking at. Yeah, I agree. And the other thing is, um, my area is a huge tourist area. You know, we have tourists from all over the world come to, you know, rural Stirling and the Trossachs. I mean, it's 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 a massive business. So if we can get the transport sorted out, that will help our economy as well. Yes, it will. Aye. And the, 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 when we talk about going forward, getting people to actually stay in Scotland, we're going to have staycations this year. Um, we're yeah. probably going to touch on it a little bit later on. The, the, the impact that staycations will have on the rural population and on the, the rural infrastructure, I think, you know, once you start talking about uh, transport, you then start talking about infrastructure, then start talking about all the things that are going to affect both your constituency and mine. And I, and I think it's something we will touch on in this conversation anyway. Yeah, I know that the, the Scottish government has already had the focus on active travel. So there's, you know, quite a lot of investment, nearly £40 million, pounds, I believe, this year on active travel and, you know, helping us get through COVID and how does it help our, our local people get from A to B? So I think that's also a start in helping us with some of these issues. Yeah, definitely. And active travel, I mean, you know, how many bikes were bought during COVID? For one of, one of the positives to have come out of COVID, <laughs> how many bikes were bought through COVID? And as cars got, my wife and I did it regularly last year. We were out in the bikes every other day and it was great because the roads were relatively quiet. But That's as right. soon as that traffic starts to build up again, you start feeling less safe, so the bike stays in the shed. So that there's, there's got to be a, a, an incentive for us now when everybody's got the bike sitting there to actually make it easier easier for us to stay on the roads because it, it'll, it'll help with our health, it'll help with emissions, it'll help with everything. So active travel, absolutely one of the things that we should be encouraging, no doubt about it. Uh, so what are your kind of views on rural connectivity? Do you want me to start on this one, everyone? Yeah, fire away, Jim. Okay. Sitting here just now, I'm not entirely convinced that my rural broadband will hold out long enough for us to be able to finish this discussion. So <laughs> rural connectivity is a major issue. Um, and I don't have a lot to say about it in terms of yeah, everybody accepts that we need it. But what's really, really annoying me at the moment is the constant pillaring that we take from the Tories about not having hit the target of rural um, broadband rollout by 2021. We've invested almost £600 million in rural broadband, and it's a reserved matter. And it really is beginning to wind me up that they have put in £25.5 million. They've put in their own proposals that they've now rolled back on, that the top 15% that they've rolled back on will affect directly the rural community because it's easy enough to do the stuff that they're talking about in the cities because you're going to hit thousands of thousands of homes. But in the rural community, that's going to be very few. So they're rolling back on their plans. We're increasing the amount of money that we're putting in. And what we're doing is we're mitigating another Tory failure. And yet they're criticising us for not doing enough to to get it done in the first place. So it's a real bugbear of mine. I've, I've done a wee analogy of it as to, to try and explain it to the farming community. I just put a, a video of it the other day there, that if you're a farmer and you're living in a, a rural area and there's a village at the bottom of your road and every winter it gets snowed in with three foot of snow and the council come up and give you half a dozen boxes of sand to throw over this three foot drift of snow, you know damn fine that it's not going to clear it. So as the farmer, you go and buy yourself a plow and you spend hours in the morning when it's snowed, clearing all the roads, but there's about half a dozen streets that you don't get to. So the council start criticising you because you haven't cleared that half a dozen streets that are real responsibility in the first place. That's how frustrating this would be. So I keep putting that analogy to farmers so that they understand just the, the, the sheer frustration that it gives me when we're trying to defend the Scottish government's position, putting 600 million quid into an area that's not even our... Um, responsibility and Westminster are criticising us and they've put 25 and a half million in. So rural connectivity 
as a real bugbear of mine. <laughs> <laughs> and you and your internet nearly went down there, Jim, when you were saying that. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. There you go. <laughs> so there you go. That was I that was a good example. <laughs> A good, a good example of what you're saying. But yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, here in Stirling, the council have done so much work on this and it's absolutely transformative. You know, they've they've connected 700 people in business, households and businesses so far. And the most recent one was the Brigaturk, which is in my ward, and it was 100 households and businesses. And Honestly, it's like night and day, it brings these people into, you know, into normal everyday life and, you know, trying to have meetings with them on Zoom and everything before, it was nearly impossible, you know, um, because the the connectivity was just so awful. Um, And now it's kind of brought, brought places to life. I mean, during COVID, it's been an absolute, you know, lifesaver. Um, having it but, it but the council has put in a lot of time and effort has taken on a rural broadband a uh, staff member and you know that that's all they work on because that's well, that's the scale of the issue right well out here um one of the 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 people who live in the wee bit where i live uh she found a a, a grant that you can actually apply to to the scottish government and they'll pay to get your rural broadband connected. Now, it's due to be rolled out for 2021, 2022 anyway, but there's a grant that you can apply for just now, which, so they're actually going to put rural broadband into us just now, sometime in the next two or three weeks, I'm told. And that, again, is Scottish government funding. It's not UK government funding, and it's a UK issue. So, and that's the bit I want to hammer them with, is the fact that they keep coming at us and, and telling us how badly we're doing, we're doing stuff on a monthly basis to get people connected, and it's their responsibility. So, yes, rural connectivity is a real bugbear for me. <laughs> and I think the other thing is, which ties into, you know, other areas, is if we want to keep people uh, living in the rural communities and, you know, they don't have to travel huge distances into cities to get their work done, they can work from home, which we've all having, we're all having to do during COVID. Um, and that going forward, making sure that they can continue to do that, um, it's absolutely vital. It's key. Yes. Yeah. And we are having to work from home. It's like you'll see just now, my way's going backward and forward here. We're living and working in the same place, and it makes life difficult. But there's nothing makes it worse than when you're sitting in a meeting and suddenly the, 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 the internet drops out and you've lost that meeting. Um, that actually happened during a, a hustings that I was recently at. You don't have to put that in the video <laughs> system. That happened in a national hustings with the food and drink sector. Mm. That the, 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 the internet dropped out 15 minutes in, and I didn't get back into the hustings until 15 minutes later. So, yeah. Yeah. It makes everything just so much more difficult, doesn't it? And stressful as well. It does. And sitting looking at a screen that's buffering, um, and you know that there are things that you have to get dealt with. It just it just adds to the stress, and we really don't need that amount of stress. Yeah. So, I think if we, as we've discussed, rural connectivity and um, having like super fast broadband is absolute key for our rural communities. Yes. Agreed. All round. I, I can attest to that. I've moved from Glasgow City uh, over to Calendar. Uh, and I work full time at home, and my internet is faster here in this little village uh, than than in Glasgow. And I wouldn't be able to work from home without it. So the next topic we're going to be talking about uh, is fly tipping. So what are your kind of experiences of fly tipping, and and how would you solve it? Uh, so fly tipping has been an issue during COVID. Um, I do think that we had a, a bigger issue, if you like, because. Um, the various waste management uh, places where, you know, the, the tips weren't open. Um, so people kind of took matters into their own hands and the, the council did have to do uh, a few, you know, um, clear up jobs. Um, since then, things have calmed down. Um, but again, we'll just have to see how we go forward with the summer months and uh, 
see if there's any issues. Obviously, with visitor management, um, people coming to the area, again, there might be some fly tipping issues with campers coming, campfires disappearing, um, and then the National Park and the Council having to, to get involved to clear up. Um, but we'll, we'll see how the summer months go. I think that that will be the, the, the test, if you like. Yeah, no, I, th I think you're right. In terms of the, there was a real upsurge in fly tipping during COVID because the the the, the communal waste uh, centres were closed, um, and we actually had quite a quite a bit of it round our doors here, uh, and it was taking the council a wee while to actually get rounds and and get them tidied up. And I get that there is there are things that we can do in terms of you know putting rangers on and all the rest of it, but it is such a you know. How do you cover a rural constituency? Um, you know, somebody driving along the road, they're going to see a ranger's van, so they're going to go five miles up the road and dump it elsewhere. It's, it's such a difficult thing to legislate against. Um, but, you know, I think, in all honesty, as you said, COVID was probably the biggest driver for what the increase was last year. As long as the, the, the communal tips stay open, then I don't think it will be as big an issue going forward. But what I would say is if you do catch them, absolutely hammer them for it so that it becomes one of those things that it really isn't worth the risk. You, you know, you're going to have to have a, a real cost benefit to doing it because the risks of getting caught, or if you do get caught, what it's going to cost you. Um, because it's, it's just a dirty thing to do. It's, a, it's a, a disrespectful, dirty thing to do, and none of us should have to put up with it. But it is a very difficult thing to police. It is. And I know that the National Park have put a lot of resources into it and got more people involved to, to do the clear-ups. Um, and I have spoken to the council and they are also putting on, you know, extra litter groups going out and picking up after. So we'll just have to see how the summer months go and see how it goes this time. Yeah, yeah, agreed. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you very much. So the, the next topic we're going to be moving on to um, is farmer and rural support. Uh, I'll leave it at that and let, uh, let you kick off, Jim. Um, yeah, farmer and rural support. I, I, you know, obviously, I've been a farmer. Um, I've been in farming all of my adult life, despite the fact I come from the town. And um, I am gravely concerned about the fact that a... Uh, the UK government have already decided that their, agri their new agricultural policy, the new ag the Agricultural Act, has already said that what they'll do is they'll phase out farm support over a seven-year period, and we're getting the um, we're getting the the, the the literature coming through from the Tories in particular. In fact, that four days after I won the nomination for this seat, uh, Douglas Ross sent letters to all the farmers in the constituency saying that he would be the farmers' champion, that he would look out for farming. Um, so I wrote a letter back to the Scottish farmer just to remind people. He also said the same to the fishermen who are now sitting with their boats in the harbours. Um, but over, over the years, farming has been supported. In, well, since the war, farming has been supported in the UK. And then we went into the EU and it was transferred to the Common Agricultural Policy, which had lots of flaws. Don't get me wrong. There's lots of things we needed to change about the Common Agricultural Policy. But the UK going back as far as Thatcher, have always hated farm support. If Thatcher had gotten her way, she would have done away with farm support back at that time. And every Tory government since has tried to do the same thing. They want to pay her back in the amount of money that has been put into farming. There's too much farm support put in there. The budget is far too big for farm support. And they call it subsidy. It's not subsidy, it's support. It's helping to, to make sure that rural constituencies stay populated, stay viable and keep people in the countryside. So the biggest concern I've got about rural support is that over the next seven years, unfettered by the EU's um, constraints, the UK government will actually this time do away with farm support. And because the UK, the, the UK Internal Market Act has put the no detriment principle in place, what that means is that if Scottish farming is supported but English farming isn't, that's then detrimental to English farmers. So therefore, if England does away with subsidy, Scotland won't be allowed to do it. 
So it's one of the one of the real critical problems that we've got going forward. And um, we don't have time to discuss all of the implications of it in this 30 minute briefing that we've got here today. But it is going to be a massive problem for us going forward. And I don't think I don't think the farming community are taking on board what it actually means yet or that it will actually happen. But I've got absolutely no doubt that the Tories will probably win the next election, which means that they'll go into this seven-year programme. This programme will go on into the beyond the period of time that they say they'll do away with farm support, and it will happen this time. They've got a guy called Ben Goldsmith who, advert, who um, advises DEFRA. That's the English equivalent of our, our Scottish department up here. And his raison d'etre is to rewild any farm that can't work without support. Now, 85% of the land down in England is what they call non-LFA, a non-less favoured area, which is land that, that has areas of natural constraint. So those farms down there could probably make a profit without any support. I've just been reading the Farmer's Guardian. Last year, the, 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 the funding or the, the wages or the income, sorry, for farms in 2021 there was only 24% of the farms in Scotland would have been making a profit without support. Now, if Ben Goldsmith gets his way, the other 75% or 76% of those, of those farms in Scotland would be rewilded. They'd be done away with. There wouldn't be any farming done in those areas at all. So, you know, from a Scottish point of view, we are in, in um, real concern. We're in, a, we're in a real vulnerable position. Because a UK Tory party does not give a damn about what's going to happen to Scottish agriculture as long as they can still provide cheap food and as long as everything's okay with an English farming community, then they're not going to worry about what's happening up here. And if you need proof of that, ask the fishing fleet in the northeast, because this is the second time that the Tories have taken their industry and thrown it to the wolves. So we, we've got some major, major battles coming up, and that's why... When the, the SNP are constantly accused of being a, a central belt centric party, that's why I was so pleased to have won this, this constituency nomination by the SNP membership, is because they're clearly giving the rural community a message that we care about agriculture, we care about farming, because we want a farmer to represent you in the parliament. And I think it's really important that we get that message across, that the SNP isn't all about what's happening in the city, it isn't all about... Um, you know, taking care of things in Glasgow and Edinburgh and Dundee, they care very much about what's happening in the rural constituency. And if we've got the fight of our life coming up, and that's why I am desperately trying to make sure that I get into the parliament so that whatever comes our way, I can be there to fight for it. Yeah, Jim, I mean, from what, from what you say, and to tie in with the other parts of the conversation, if we are looking at our rural communities in a holistic sense in terms of economy, you know, jobs, housing. I mean, we need to look after the farming community. So we need to make sure that, you know, yep. what, what the UK government might want to do to us doesn't happen. You know? Because yep. what the, from the what farming I, community by and large the, yeah, so, sorry, Evelyn, are we jinking my, my internet there again? <laughs> when people talk about farming subsidy, they think that what we're doing is throwing money at farmers and they just spend it willy-nilly. You're giving support to a community because when a farmer gets money, the first thing he does is spend it. It might be in the garage, it might be in the, in the post office, it might be buying a new tractor. There's a whole mile in Perth of businesses right along the Dunkeld Road that are entirely dependent on the farming community of this area. And they're selling tractors, quad bikes, trailers, timber, fencing materials, feed, um, veterinary supplies. There's an entire mile long area on the Dunkeld Road entirely de dedicated to su supplying the farming community in this area. If farmers don't get support, if farmers aren't there, those businesses go as well. So it's not just the farming community that you're supporting. It's an entire downstream <clears throat> community that goes with it. So the farmer's kids go to the local school. They buy in the local shop. They go to the local pub. They, they buy fuel from the local garage. And it keeps communities alive. 
Now, <clears throat> granted, there are other things that you can do with connectivity. You can set up wee businesses in rural communities, but you still need that farming community to have the, the, the broad substance of your rural community will always come from the farming community. And we have to protect it with everything we've got or we're not going to have a sustainable food uh, industry in this country. The food and drink sector is almost entirely built on the, the, the quality and the reputation of agriculture. So if you lose that bit of it, you lose a massive part of the thing that makes us stand out, that makes us unique. We'd lose our unique selling point. So we've got to protect it at all costs. And the UK government are going to do everything in their power to make sure that subsidy, support, whatever you want to call it, is done away with in seven years. So it's, it's a crucial time for us. Moving on to housing. So housing is an absolute key priority for the SNP government. Uh, locally here for our administration, it has been a key priority. We are building all over our local communities here, uh, including the rural area, um, which is actually a key priority. It's very, very difficult usually to, to, to build houses in rural areas because there are additional issues such as um, land supply. Uh, land is in very short supply uh, in rural communities. It tends to be more expensive and, and it also tends to have uh, infrastructure problems, which again makes uh, building houses just so much more expensive in rural areas. Um, however, I can say that the Scottish Government have been brilliant. They've uh, provided additional support um, to help us build um, quite large developments in some rural areas. And that's a key to, to helping rural communities um, to allow people to, to continue to live rurally and not move away. Um, and I think we have, a, we have a target here of 700 houses in the, the lifetime of the administration. Unfortunately, COVID has put a wee bit of a dent in achieving our target um, because the, the construction sites were shut down for a while, but we're working hard um, on that, that priority. Um, so obviously the SNP, uh, if re-elected, have made the pledge that we'll build 100,000 more houses which is brilliant because we've already nearly built 100,000, but there's much more work to do, obviously. We do have to consider rural communities, um, and I know that, that that is going to be a key priority. The big thing, I think, going forward will be um, providing housing for young people. Um, young people um, locally are finding it really difficult to go on the property ladder, um, and I know that house prices last year, um, even during COVID, went up 8.4%. So we know that COVID has affected young people disproportionately. So one of the big things will be getting stuck into building those houses, but making sure that young people can, can get a house, an affordable house, and can live in our rural communities. And I, I assume the same will be for you, Jim. Yeah, but I have to say, one of, one of the, the things I, I keep coming back to, uh, but I've got two daughters, 25 and 27, and I keep looking at their situation. Neither of them own a property. And I'm thinking, how would they, by their own means, get a start on the property ladder? What chance have they got of getting a better or even similar standard of living to the one that my wife and I have managed to carve out for ourselves. Now, yeah. we've worked damned hard to get to where we are. But starting now with the, with the property prices being the way they are, how does a young person manage to get the money saved up to get themselves a deposit and actually get onto the housing ladder in the first place? It must be absolutely torture. And if you put that on, on, on top of everything else that has, has you know, the... the the inflation that has happened since I was a, a young guy, um, you know, I just wouldn't know where to start in, in this day and age, to be perfectly honest with you. But the point that you made earlier on about rural housing and young people, I think it's one of the, the key issues. If we're going to achieve Ambition 2030 and we want to get the food and drink sector to be worth £30 billion uh, pounds a year, the Scottish economy, a year 2030, we need to make sure 
that all these rural industries are working together so that they can feed into the, the bigger national picture. And if people don't have anywhere to live, they can't work in rural businesses. So we're seeing a, a huge um, rise in the number of, of um, holiday lets and B&Bs um, on farms. Now, I, had, I don't have a problem with that because some of these are derelict properties have been done up and they're making an income off them. But you then need people to work in these areas as those businesses grow. So there has to be the provision of the right kind of housing that's affordable, but it's still warm, it's still clean, it's still safe for people to live in. Because I've also seen some of the old, uh, some of the old estate houses that have been allowed to go to rack and ruin, and yet people are still living in them. That mm -hmm. shouldn't be the case either. If people are going to be living in houses, they should be good quality houses nowadays. So that we've, we've got a, a, house, a, a particular rural housing issue, um, and it's going to take a lot of work to be able to sort it. Building 100,000 new houses, brilliant, fantastic. Where are we going to be building them? And who's going to be getting the benefit of them? It can't all be centred in the, in the centres, in the big centres. Um, we need to find a way to make sure that young families can live and grow in the countryside in good quality housing. And I think it's something that we will need to tackle as we go forward. You're absolutely right, Jim. And the, the issue that some of our communities have because young people have moved away because they, they, they haven't been able to get a house, get a job, you know, the, the usual rural issues, is that you find areas where, um, you know, the, the school role, you know, has got so low that, you know, the schools are closing down and then you're kind of losing the heart of your community. Um, so you find that, you know, very rural areas, they, they, they basically start to die. Um, and that is not, you know, we need to bring people in, we need to have the housing, because if you have the housing, you have the young couples, you have the children to keep the school, the, these schools open. And it's it's just so sad when you start losing your, your, your primary schools and your nurseries in these communities. So um, I think that, that the 100,000 houses pledge is it's amazing and it be transformative for these rural communities and we'll be able to create sustainable communities get young people that their, their housing and be able to keep our schools open as well yeah absolutely couldn't agree more um so so moving on uh swiftly uh, just because of time um to climate change so this obviously encompasses a lot of what we've been talking about already um but if there's anything that you feel like hasn't been touched upon, or if you want to delve a little bit deeper, uh, now's your chance. In terms of the climate emergency, which we clearly have, I think the Scottish Government's net zero by 2045 is fantastic, it's ambitious, it's achievable, um, but from a rural context, the, the one thing that the farming community are going to not kick back about, but certainly going to have concerns about is, well, what do you mean, what are we going to have to do about it? Um, so the Scottish government's position hasn't been to be a top-down position where they say, right, you will now do this. What they've done is they've set up five working groups, the beef working group, the crofters working group, the dairy, the pigs, and the hill working group. So all of these different sectors of agriculture are now coming together to say, right, okay, here are our issues, here's what our emissions are, how are we going to combat that? So the, whether it's peat restoration, whether it's more tree planting, we're doing a hell of a lot of work and making sure that the agriculture community are given the best chance to continue to produce world-class food, but at the same time tackle the, the emissions that we have to reduce by roughly 25%. So from that point of view, I think we're doing a really good job, but I know that there's a hell of a lot more that, we have, that we're that we going to have to do going forward. Yeah, absolutely. Here in, here in Stirling, you know, the council... Uh, declared a climate emergency. They're working really closely with the public just now on what the climate emergency plan will look like. Um, and I think the public are really engaged with the climate emergency um, debate. Uh, I know locally that there's been so many people have contacted me about land, about planting trees, allotments. And it's great to see people that are, you know, they're looking at the news every day, they know what's going on. And I think during COVID, people have had more time to think about our environment, what we're doing to it, 
and and how we and how we can move forwards with a vision together for how we can make things better. So um, I'm I'm really excited about the the Scottish government's targets. It's great to see that we're world leading in this area, and it's great to see that local people want to help. Yeah, and we've got COP twenty six coming in November. Um, I think that is a massive opportunity. We talk about the food and drink sector, we talk about our agricultural produce. It's a brilliant opportunity for us to say, this is who we are, this is what we're doing to tackle it, this is the place that you want to use as your exemplar. And what a, what a marketing opportunity as much as anything else. If we're going to have a COVID recovery, if we're going to rebuild our economy, the best way to do it is to be marketed fantastically. And COP26 gives us that opportunity. Yeah, it, you're right. It's a it's a re, going to be a real showcase of what what we want to achieve and what we could achieve together. Yeah, and what we're currently doing because we're yeah. doing a lot of good stuff just now. We are absolutely fantastic. Thank you. I'm I'm just going to cut it there and move on to the next subject very quickly. Uh, so the uh, next point will be national park. Uh, obviously for um, Evelyn, but also day trippers into, into the area and the visitor management issues that come with that slash education, uh, which I think, Jim, you were going to cover on that. Um, Evelyn, did you want to start on that? Yeah, I'll kick off. Um, so visitor management issues to my area have been massive during COVID. And the, the season has just begun again and tourists are starting to will be starting to come back. Um, there have been various issues, as, as we've touched on, um, litter, poor parking, um, generally sometimes a different type of visitor has come. Um, often people are coming for a few days with um, tents, setting campfires, um, and in the, maybe getting in the car and leaving everything behind them, which uh, has been quite unusual until this time, I would say. So it's been a real headache. Um, people have not been happy locally, as you can imagine. Um, but the, the, the police, the National Park, the, the council have been working together very, very closely uh, because they know that potentially these issues will arise again this year. I know the Scottish Government have been looking at this. There's been a working group set up and um, money has been put forward to various uh, schemes to help. But I think moving forward, we'll have to see how the summer goes and um, possibly what more funding might be required for infrastructure because, you know, if, if we continue to have those same sort of numbers coming to the area, we will probably have to put more money in to uh, solve the problem. How, how are you getting on there, Jim? Yeah, it's, it, it's an issue right across the country. It um, doesn't matter who you speak to. Um, and, and I get the point that you're making about the, the kind of folk that are coming into the countryside. I, don't, I, wouldn't say, I wouldn't say it's all badness. A lot of it is ignorance. And I think we've got a, two, uh, a, a two-pronged problem here. We've got the immediacy. So what is our infrastructure facilities at the moment? How can we tackle that? Do we, does it take more money? It will definitely take ranger services in order to be able to guide people in the, in the correct use of the countryside, for want of a better phrase. And people, have got the, 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 people don't have the right to roam. That's a fallacy. What they have is the right of responsible access. And having the right of responsible access means that they should know what the countryside code is. They should know what it means. If they see just a wide open field, that's where somebody makes a living. There's, there are things happening in there. And even if it's just grass growing, that grass is somebody's silage for their winter feed. So the, the short term problem is we need to make sure that the areas that are worst affected have patrols on them with people with, I'm not going to call it enforcement. I'd call it people who should be helping to guide folk into the correct use of the land. But the longer term issue going forward, because I think what this will hopefully do, and this is a positive thing, is it will encourage far more staycations. And if we're going to have staycations here in Scotland, that's a good thing, because people will end up spending money here. But when they're mm -hmm. spending money here, they have to do it in a, in, a, in a fashion which is responsible, and it doesn't leave a bigger headache than what it brings to the, to the area in the first place. So there, there is a call right going out right now 
that is asking for the right of responsible access in the countryside code to be taught in schools. And I don't think that's a bad thing for everybody in Scotland because we are so closely linked with our countryside. You know, it doesn't matter where you are in Scotland, you're, you're, you're only half an hour's drive from some scenic part of the country. So let's make sure that our own people understand and value and respect the countryside that we've got so that they look after it. And then as we welcome other people from other parts of the world, they're going to do exactly the same thing. They'll respect their places as well. And, and I think there's a, an education and there is a, a, an, an immediate problem that we need to deal with infrastructure, and that will take money, but there is an education thing going forward. And I see it as a real opportunity for us to be able to grow our tourist sector in Scotland and have far more people stay. On a beautiful day like today, the sun's absolutely beating out down there. You couldn't be any place nicer. So let's put the infrastructure in place so that people enjoy their stay, but they also respect it. So when they go home, they take their rubbish with them. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I mean, obviously, Stirling and uh, our rural areas, it's massive tourist industry here. And we want to make sure that people come, they enjoy what we have here, uh, our beautiful scenery and, you know, all our, you know, hot hot spots if you like they end up hot spots or beauty spots um but but they do they respect the place um and as you say they take their letter home at the end yeah perfect